Hey guys, what's up? It's Dean. Welcome to the Manful Yoga Podcast. Today I am joined by the godfather of mobility, uh, the supple leopard himself, Kelly Starrett. Welcome to the show. Nice to see you, my friend. You know, godfather means that like, you think I'm going around whacking knees and like, uh, you know, ex ex extracting bribes. I mean, I feel like that's sort of a difficult uh, analogy, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Father. Yeah. Well, you're whacking knees in a good way. You're like whacking them and then relieving them of joint pain. It's just, you know, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's right. um, so I like to start the show off just talking with how we got, how we met, how we got to know each other. Um, and if you listen to the Ready State podcast uh, that I did with you a few months ago, then you'll know this story already um, about how we met at a conference um, and how Kelly eventually wrote the foreword for Yoga for Athletes. Um, but since you're on the show, Kelly, I'd love for you to kind of just retell that story of how we met uh, at that at marketing conference a few years ago. This can be a cautionary tale for everyone that if you have ADD, fidget, hate sitting in a chair, uh, like me, um, I have figured out early on that I need to be in the back of the classroom where I could fidget and move and change my position mm -hmm. unless, unless I need that professor to perceive me as deeply interested. Then I sit right in the front row and suffer. But uh, those are my sort of two options. So I figured out a long time ago, and especially in grad school, when I was really paying attention, that if I could get out of my chair, sit on the ground, sit on the plinth, uh, the treatment table, and uh, I just felt better. And I could ended up, like so many other people, I feel like, you know, if I sat in this chair, which was designed for a uh, some member of the staff to stack. It was, it was not really designed for, for bodies. I'm 6'2", mm -hmm. I'm 238 pounds. Um, you know, I, I have pretty good range of motion, but man, I have a few hours of that and I'm like, God, I feel like terror. And yeah. then I wanna go train or move later on. So one of the things that I figured out was that if I could sit in the back, I could be prepping my hips and working on my middle splits and couch stretching and, and just sort of fidgeting around getting ready for, for the really the main course, which was going to play. And so there we are in the back of a gigantic lecture hall. And I was like, oh, hell no, I'm not getting trapped in the middle of, I mean, the, the last chair was like in the middle of like 500 right. people. And there I am. And then there's some guy next to me doing the same thing. You know, and I'm like, oh yeah, well, I see your middle splits and I, I raise you, you know, straddle splits. So all of a sudden we were, I was like, hey, what's up? And uh, of course, it turns out we knew each other. So yeah uh, and that and then um you know call it confirmation bias but you and i kept running into each other which uh, i felt like man this is if dean is doing the going to the same things i am i must be on the right path yeah and you guys were kind enough to invite me to dinner that was uh that was my fanboy day i was like oh my gosh kelly Starr is stretching with me right now uh <laughs> let's take a let's take a photo because this isn't gonna last and then i ended up seeing you like the, the the rest of the week so um so yeah that was awesome yeah and that's how you know i think is a really excellent segue into hopefully what we're talking about is we are both sort of obsessed with position and how you get there entirely up mm -hmm. to you you know and, and so many tools so many tactics but what's not sort of debatable are principles why can't you access your positions and I think everyone intuitively agrees, yes, I should stretch, whatever that means, or intuitively agrees, yes, I should have access to my full physiology. You know, the things that every human, every doctor should be, says we should be able to do. And the real magic here, and I think the magic of your book is, when am I going to do that? How do I work that in around my Peloton class or, you know, my weightlifting practice or my family? Mm -hmm. and I think that's the problem is that traditionally we haven't made these things very accessible. And we haven't certainly really looked at the changes and drivers of behavior change. So how much or how little can I get away with what is essential? And what we've seen is because we haven't we had really sort of adequate answers, people have dropped it off. It's much more fun to work your butt off, you know, than it is to, uh, that is to kind of put position as a key component or key metric to your movement practice. And suddenly, you know, if, you, if you're into yoga, and I hope you are, uh, those things are taken care of for you. You know, you, you will be there. But if you're into yoga and you want to ride, you know, your bikes millions of hours and lift some weights, man, it suddenly gets a little bit complicated. And mm -hmm. potentially the one hour of yoga or two 30-minute sessions you're doing a week may not be adequate to overcome being old, 
your environment, lifestyle, your old injuries, the, the fact that you really like to deadlift heavy, I mean, mm -hmm. like, and your stress because you're a newborn and, and a stressful yeah. job, so you don't have the tissues to handle it. So really what I think you and I, you know, we agree on so many things, but we're both obsessed with saying, hey, how are you going to work this into your busy life? Yeah. And um, two things, two things that came up there. So you have a, so with the ready state, you have some kind of a, an overall, I don't know what to, what to call it, an overall framework for how you view things and principles is one part of that. And what are, what are your other parts? I, I saw this on, on your Instagram um, a few days ago, but you have principles and then what else comes, comes with that? Well, I think, um, you know, what people don't understand about our work or my work is really trying to come up with a model that explains, predicts, and is communicatable around complex movement behavior. That sounds like, what did I even say? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, the, for the last 10,000 years, we really haven't evolved or changed much. Let's start with that hypothesis, that... I'm a little fatter, your femur's a little longer, but we look very much the same the last 10,000 years. And that means that the shoulder is still the shoulder and the hip is still the hip. Mm -hmm. And let's also acknowledge for a second that humans are ruthlessly clever and obsessed with optimization, not in the, like, I'm gonna biohack and drink this fat coffee and sit in front of this LED light, but like, how do I carry this rock further? How do I out throw my friends? How do I wrestle more effectively? Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting is that if you take that view, then all of a sudden you were like, wow, every movement tradition, every martial art tradition, every yoga tradition, every uh, fighting or, or gymnastics tradition or track and field tradition is really about the sort of continuing refinement of people thinking this is a better way to get the most biomotor function. This is how we get the most wattage, the most power, the most output, the quickest runners. And then all you have to do is drive some consilience. So if you suddenly really, really, truly understand a little bit of how the shoulder works, then you go to a yoga class and you're like, oh, oh, this is super clever. Like, like they knew this. And then you're like, oh, I understand Olympic weightlifting. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, Joseph Pilates wasn't wasting anyone's time. He understood this too. Mm -hmm. And so there are principles about how the body works. And what we're trying to do is help people on a very base level say, you know, Hey, look, you should be able to put your arms over your head. You know, that's really cool. And, mm -hmm. and if you can't, that's fine. It's totally your choice and it may or may not cause you pain. One of the th really big dr things that we're trying to change here is we have to evolve away from only asking, does this thing cause you pain or not? Right? Because I'll tell you what, this raise your hand if you're pain free, you know I mean? And what right. you'll see is that most people, are not raising their hands because they have an old injury history or they got tackled and their knee is stiff or, you know, they had to sit or something. So pain is this normal condition of the human body. But what we shouldn't be doing is making all of our decisions about, do I have pain or no pain? Because I can give you a bottle of bourbon and erase your pain. Mm -hmm. I can give you opiates and THC and I can erase your pain. So I can, you know, if you're a man, you know, if you're a cis, you know, hetero man, um, a beautiful person can walk past and you're like, Oh, wow, I, I feel great. <laughs> you know, uh, all of a sudden there can be, you know, so what we know is that the brain is the most sophisticated structure in the known universe and pain is a complex psycho, emotional, ex personal experience. We all have sort of different experiences with this, but if we just wait around to say, I need to change my behavior because I'm in pain, then that re really, there's a big gap there, right? Between my, 13 year old playing all the water polo and then not playing water polo because something hurts in her shoulder. So mm -hmm. clearly there are some things we can do. And, and, and now it gets a little muddy because now we're like, well, are we talking about injury prevention? Cause there's nothing we can do to prevent injuries. And I'm like, is that true? You know, because let's, let's first define our terms. Are you injured? Yes or no. Injury means you cannot occupy your role in society. You can't do your job. You can't occupy your role in the family. You can't recreate. You can't go to education. That's a medical emergency. If your back hurts so bad you can't do your work, that's a medical emergency. We want you mm -hmm. to go get help. And, and our medical system is really good at putting those flames out temporarily. But our current medical model is predicated on 
emergency and catastrophe mm-hmm. and is not set up to tell you how to live or how to move or how to how to think about technique or skill being a human being. So what we're trying to do is help people move beyond this this conversation of pain or no pain because that's really like oh I I should do yoga because my back hurts like that's the worst reason to do yoga ever right well, and for a lot of reasons but um, or, yeah. time, or like hey I, so I should change my behavior because you know I should put oil in my car because it blew up my engine I mean that's really what we're we're waiting around that's our current model and mm-hmm. don't get me wrong a movement practice is the way out of this. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your movement practice is. We're totally agnostic. And in fact, if you go into the work or writing, you can see that I am like pro Pilates and pro yoga and pro CrossFit mm-hmm. and you know pro Olympic lifting and pro gymnastics. Because ultimately, I don't care. We, I have strong feelings, and we can argue about should you be bench pressing? How fit do you need to be? You know, do you, you know? But ultimately, are you taking your tissues through their normative physiologic ranges? Do you have control in those ranges? That's defining mobility. Do, you, do your mm-hmm. tissues give you access to your positions? And that can be also brain and nervous system. But also, do you have the, the control there? Do you have the technique there? And what we've been trying to do is go into our movement traditions and reconcile those movement traditions with what we understand from my background of classical physical therapy education mm-hmm. and our medical model. And there should be no dissonance or points of interference, those things should overlap beautifully on top of one another. And suddenly we can say, okay, I see that you not only can't put your arms over your head, but you can't create any rotation when you put your arms over your head. You can't create any torque. You can't create any stability in that position. So that's a really weak position. Well, it's interesting to us then to um, ask, well, how do we restore that position? And it turns out sometimes um, you need a little help and that help could be a mobilization. Sometimes you need a little skill training. That could be a skill transfer exercise or a technique transfer exercise. But the first order of business is to spend time in the position. So this morning, I'm drinking my coffee, checking my email, sitting on the ground cross-legged, sitting in a full squat. Why? Because the most important thing I can do is make sure that I'm telling my brain and my body, these are positions I value. And these are normative ranges. These are the ranges that I want to have so that I can be more powerful in my deadlift or that my biking is more fluid. Or that if I go drop into a yoga class in my neighborhood later on, I'm not going to fall on my face and I'm going to be able to actually enjoy that. Mm-hmm. I mean, Iyengar was like, holy crap, these, these people can't even do yoga. We better pull up these straps and blocks because they can't <laughs> even get into the shapes. Right. So. You know, what I really am a fan of is regression and progression and simplifying the the model. I think we're drowning in tactics and tools and systems, but they're all Mm. the same. And ultimately, I want you to find something that you really like to do that's super fun, that makes you tribal and puts you into a community of people that makes you feel jacked and strong and capable for the sports and the activities that you want to do. Yeah. So something that you were, uh, something that came up for me as you were talking about that is, this is really like your human, the human body is very complicated. Like there's, there's so many different considerations oh, yeah. and you are trying to create a model that is simple enough to be, to work for this incredibly complex, you know, structure. Uh, you had a post a couple a few weeks ago that I saw, um, where you were kind of saying like, look, we can't understand the entire body in 30 seconds. And the quote exactly is, it may be that the most complex structure in the known universe, the human brain attached to the most complicated and sensitive physiology in the known universe, your body, in the most complex societal structure in the known universe, humans cannot be adequately explained in a 30 second TikTok video. And I love that. (laughs) You know, (laughs) and, and the responses that you got to that were just like, were, were like, people were mad about like you, I think you started that post off saying stretching is good for you. And someone's like, there's no studies that say stretching is good for you. I'm like, wow, is this like, is this what we're having debates about? Whether or not like stretching is helpful? Jeez. Yeah. There's a lot of misplaced precision. Don't get me wrong. TikTok is highly amusing. I, uh, just here's an aside. I know we're talking about really important things here, but I want everyone to do this. I want you to open up your Instagram right now. And I want you to go to the magnifying search field and push on that and see what the algorithm says about you. Mm. And you want to really find out who you are, 
find out like, so I've done this with some of my world champion friends and, and my world champion friend is like, you know, he's a huge, big, strong strapping guy. He's like, wow, evidently I'm into hunky dudes and Jack girls. That's all it is. Hunky <laughs> dudes, Jack girls, pages and pages, and pages of naked bodies, bodies and skimpy things, lifting heavy weights, glistening bodies. And I was like, wow, you know, that really says, you know, what this is about. And, um, you know, social media has done two things. One is the tech has given us unparalleled and unprecedented access into the, all of these parallel universes. So when I started CrossFit in 2004, um, still thinking this is pretty early internet days. Like there's no iPhone, there's no, you know, video camera on the iPhone. There's still there was no, gift. there was no anxiety yet. Like <laughs> gifts are, there was anxiety, just different. Uh, gifts are, uh, still a thing, how we're teaching with gifts and, but it was the first time where you could go to a blog and actually see how the Chinese weightlifters were lifting, or you could drop mm. in and suddenly have access to Olympic lifting coaches and gymnasts. And they were talking for the first time. I don't think people realize that this phenomenon where we have access to all of these disparate fields is a really new phenomenon. It's only about 20 years old. Mm. And um, now what's really remarkable is, you know, last night, uh, Juliet and I went to an NBA basketball game where we're working with, because we, we know the strength and head of human performance there, Javier uh, Gillette. And he, you know, we worked with him at the Rockets. Now he's at the Timberwolves. And then I'm emailing, uh, I have a bunch of the Niners coaches in our course. And then I'm emailing a, a first ever major league baseball woman manager and then i'm working on a track and field olympic 100 meter arm swinger and then i'm talking to a bobslayer and that is a phenom that is not not me being i'm great that is holy moly suddenly we're really sharing and breaking down these siloed walls and we want to continue to do that but there the the result of that is that if unless you have a cipher or a key, you can be overwhelmed with information. You can be overwhelmed with mm -hmm. tactics and tools and what's vital and how do I, I have 45 minutes or an hour to train or move my body. What do I do? And it can feel really overwhelming and then overlay, you know, all the optimization plus nutrition. And what you have is a lot is a hot mess. People don't know what first mm -hmm. principles are. You know, I'm an intermittent faster. Like, well, that's great. And it turns out that, you know, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating works just as well as caloric restri restriction, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, Lots oh, you're, a, you're a keto bro. Great. Well, it turned out that wasn't really great for endurance athletes. And so everyone, you know, I think one of the things we're seeing right now is this, we call it lazy tribalism, where you can identify with a group of people who exercise in a certain way. And I don't mean to, I'm not disparaging anyone. Like I'm a CrossFitter. Um, but something that can make you less open to understanding other process. And one of the things that I am a huge fan of for the coaches I work with, and if you're a teacher or a coach listening to this, you need to go take someone else's class. You need to jump into someone else's movement system. You need to go and just expose yourself. Just, you think yeah. you're, you think you're the crap and you're, and you're moving well, we'll just jump into someone else's system. Go take a new class and a new system. And you may not be like, I'm never trained like this, but you'll th you should thrive there. And you'll never, you'll never be the best. I mean, if you go out on a 5K run with some runners, you're going to suffer, but you should be able to go do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we want to do is make sure that we're open. And what I would encourage everyone else to do is to let someone program for you, your friends program. Uh, don't be precious, be curious and understand where the, the areas of overlap are and, yeah. and be really curious about that. So then, cause what ends up happening is you begin to understand first principles and then the world is your oyster, you know, mm -hmm. you know, what are first principles for humans and sleep? Well, you better sleep. <laughs> well, okay. That drives a whole bunch of behaviors. It means I probably should cut my caffeine by noon or two or three mm -hmm. it means I need to, you know, get into some dim light and prep myself for a sleeping routine. So suddenly you can see that there are a whole bunch of behaviors that are driven through this first principle. What about nutrition? Well, turns out you should probably eat some protein and lots of fruits and vegetables and drink water, right? And you should make it whole foods. That is the keystone of performance nutrition right now. I'm talking about like Tour de France level nutrition. Watch any of the 
behind the scenes on Amazon with a premier soccer, right? Premier football. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing is like at halftime, the greatest athletes in the world have a sip of fruit juice. They have a, <laughs> you know, like, like it's pretty amazing to see them come in after the game and drink, drink their individualized, like whole food shake. And so what we want to do with movement is the same thing. Instead of throwing up this, you know, this tribalism, and it's confusing because, again, the algorithm is rewarding abs. So if, as long as I have good genetics and I was born lean and I have abs, I must be a really excellent <laughs> you know, athlete. And I'll tell you that those things ne don't, aren't necessarily commensurate. So I think mm -hmm. our aesthetics and how we're being changed and driven by that um, is a problem. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a huge problem. And I see really, really good coaches every once in a while have to throw up a picture, a sexy picture of themselves for the thirst trap, you know, and, uh, you know, that is just an ex a normal expression of the system, given how crazy the system is to get attention. Yeah. Um, so what I'm, what I'm, what I'm hearing and what's the big theme of what we're talking, what you've been talking about is this idea of, of, of principles and basic movement principles that you can find in one discipline that apply equally to another discipline. So, you know, being able to, you know, there's, there, there are certain ways that you should be moving your shoulder and you'll find that if you're doing it properly in yoga and you'll find it if you're doing it properly um, in weight training. I wanted to ask you a specific question for people who are mostly doing yoga. Um, what are some, some, of, some of their biggest weaknesses? Why would, why would someone who's doing a predominantly yoga workout want to add in um, other movements and what would those be? Let's look at the fact that... Uh... Let's start with, um, can you go to the Olympics if you only do yoga? So I'm like, nope, <laughs> you're going to no. need some intensity. And yeah. that doesn't mean do yoga faster, right? And do cardio, right. cardio blast yoga. Mm -hmm. It means you may need to go, you know, do some hill repeats once in a while. You need to raise your heart rate up. Okay. So that's a simple way to improve your conditioning. Right. And I think we get into, we get into the weeds and again, not bashing anyone's practice. You do you, but, uh, is changing the parameters of yoga to, to solve a whole, is that the best expression of what I can potentially get out of a, a yoga movement practice? Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I just need to do yoga with hand weights all the time and just put those weights on my wrists and elbows to make it, you know what I mean? So suddenly you're like, mm -hmm. mm, okay, so. Um, you know, you probably can't expose your tissues to the kinds of loading required to be super, super strong and more durable in the world, mm -hmm. which means you probably need to swing a kettlebell too. So, yeah. Right. So there's a or, lot of things that yoga can be good for, but there's, there's no reason to try and fit the square yoga peg into a round hole to satisfy all of your Where is needs. the pulling in yoga? There's a lot of approximation there's, there's of the tissues. <laughs> you're, you're driving force through the joints, but you're not hanging from the joints, mm -hmm. right? And that distraction force through... So all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, you mean I need a pull-up bar? Yep, that'll do it. And some dumbbells? Yep. And so what you can suddenly see is, well, gosh, I don't have any equipment I can have a pretty badass practice, work on balance and breathing and organization and muscular endurance and- Hey, Kelly, you know, I just want to stop really quick. So can you explain organization? Because that term was actually relatively new to me until your friend, Brian McKenzie, introduced me to that concept. Can you explain what organization means for people? So full, full transparency, Brian and I are very old confidants and friends. And one of the things that we try to do is understand that we often um, inherit language from the coaches and masters in before us. Hmm. And not that they're wrong, but we may have more information now and a bigger data set than they have now. And the words they were using sometimes get co-opted, like the word core. I don't even know what that means anymore, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, oh, you mean you have a six pack? Oh, okay. So the what we used to say is like uh, midline or braced or, um, and what we want to say is that there are positions of the body where I'm able to have more access to my physiology. I can generate more power. I can take more load. 
um, a better reaction time. If there's a, you have a 10 lights in a room in your house, I want you to have all 10 on. I want you to have as much movement choice as possible. But you can definitely live in your house with one light in the corner and, and feed yourself and do your activities of daily living, but that's not really what we're talking about, right? That's, what, that's that dirty term that you'll see in physical therapy within normal limits, which means I didn't check it or I'm not getting paid to check it or you, you, it's fine, right? It doesn't hurt to put your bra on. It's totally fine. Or you can tie your shoes. So you must be normal versus I want you to have as much movement choice, movement optimization, access mm -hmm. to your physiology that you can because I want you to be able to go pick up new skills and learn play things or fall or crash yeah. or make mistakes. We're getting beyond just survival in, into actually enjoying and thriving with your body. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't think people realize how awesome their bodies are and how powerful you can feel. And, you know, it's just super fun. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about playing, right, being durable. And when we say the word organization, what we're talking about is, well, based on your available tissue physiology, based on the positions of the sports you're in, how do we organize your body in a way – to have the most access to physiology. So here's an example. I work with a lot of elite cyclist teams and I work with specialized. And if we're in the, in the uh, wind tunnel, I can basically reduce an average person down into a, a person who cannot pedal the bike anymore. But that person is now very aerodynamic. So I can take you and bend your body into the most aerodynamic position ever and you'll have an organization that doesn't allow you to pedal or breathe, but you will be hyper, hyper optimized for the wind. Hmm. But instead, I need to have this sort of dance between what's available to you and how much can we get you organized in this position to, you know, to, to do the most work or to have the most movement access. So here's a good example. I work with the pararescue. And the biggest injury that the pararescue, this is the Air Force pararescue, they go in and, and pick people up after accidents and things, um, is getting the litter, getting the stretcher out of the helicopter is the most dangerous thing they do. Like you're not getting shot at, it's not flying helicopters. It's they're in a little tiny room and they've got to pick up, they're wearing all their body armor and stuff, and they've got to pick up a stretcher with a person on it and rotate and twist. So it's impossible to get into a perfect zombie deadlift position. You know, you can't do a perfect standing tall, forward fold, load your hips. You need to get down, organize the best you can as you grab the handles, and then figure out how to be in a stable position. And guess what? You don't have to have perfect technique. Hmm. You have to have good access to your physiology. But in those positions, like the wind tunnel, if I don't – give you the technique or work towards normalizing your movement behavior, range of motion possibility, then you're left with a very few options. And those few options are less than optimal. How do I know? Mm -hmm. Well, we ran that experiment where we had really stiff guys with poor technique, lifting the stretcher in wretched positions and then injuring or tweaking or causing pain in their, in their movement systems. Mm -hmm. So that's so what we a, say when organized. So there's a trade-off between organization, the, the what the movement requires and what is optimal for your body, what your body is going to be able to perform. And that will be predicated on the sport or the activity you're doing and your access to your range of motion and your, and your control in that range of motion. Mm -hmm. So I think what ends up gets weird is all of a sudden we're like, you know, I need you in this organized brace midline position. Don't deflect your spine. We're doing perfect deadlifting and front squatting. Now go play Premier League soccer and show me the forces mm. on the body and the twisting and the, you know, and, and you're suddenly you're like, oh, you're, oh, that may not be the best way to prepare for that. And my mm. brain is going to have to be able to do these things. So does that mean I should be all noodly and floppy in the gym? No. What it means is we train in a very formal movement language and then we try to expose the tissues to be able to do these things and handle these things. And through regular play and exposure, that's enough. We don't have to replicate every force going through the spine in a premier football league, premier soccer match. Um, if you, you know, think about how fragile we, we make everyone think they are in the gym, right? Oh, don't run your back at all. Oh, you know, mm. like, you know, 
and then watch some professional football. You know, we've got a big, you know, weekend coming up with, you know, the Niners playing, a whole bunch of people playing. And watch how just the contact of these 20-year-olds beating on each other. You mm-hmm. know, and you're like, okay, maybe we're more durable than I thought. Or watch, watch some soccer, you know, in the Premier League, and you're going to be like, wow. You know, we just watched basketball. And the amount of cutting, hitting, knocking, you know, smashing into each other last night that we saw, Julian and I are like, wow, you have to be so durable and so powerful to play this game. And that doesn't look like perfect Mm -hmm. yoga, idealized Olympic lifting, but those formal movement training languages are the place to start. Got it. So you have to use the formal training, the organized training, the best you can to build that solid foundation so that when you do get into that play and that informal and formal movements you're as prepared as you possibly can be um we actually talked about this with aaron uh with aaron alexander on the uh uh from the align podcast on the show and you wrote the forward for him for for his uh for his book and we were talking about you know we were talking about how you can continue to decide. You can do more and more formalized training, but eventually you have to get to this point where, okay, let's let's move into less formal. Otherwise, you're just setting yourself up to where you're only strong in one position, and you're only in in reality you're not adapted well to being able to do any sort of informal or play, and you're going to be at a higher risk of injury than than someone who is introducing more play and, and more How? formalized training. So. Does that mean I should round my back in every direction every time I deadlift? So I should do some good deadlifts where I can generate the most force and I should do some really poor technical deadlifts? No. What it means is, so that's, that's a difficult thing. The hypothesis is correct. And Aaron is, we've known Aaron forever and a super smart guy. Obviously, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, what we get into then suddenly is, oh, I guess technique doesn't matter because when I do a sport, you know, it's not going to matter. But the organization of the hip and the shoulder do matter. And the balance system matters. I think what we often see is that we have these formal movement training positions where I can handle load and breathing. Um, And then I have these unloaded where I'm not put, you know, because, you know, what we really are talking about is the language of the spine predominantly here. And that if you... um, you know, the shoulder will be the most stable under all the techniques. That's why, and the hip will be this most stable under the mo- all this formal techniques. But usually, if we really get into the middle of this, we're like, hey, I need to be able to side twist and bend and rotate and do these things. And I'm out of this plane, but the shoulder and the hips are still doing their shoulder and hip stuff. So hmm. tackling someone, you know, there's a good example of connection between formal and, and, and problem solving. We teach principles so that people can better problem solve in sports and activities. So it's not about you being able to do a pull-up. It's about you being able to grab a bar and create a stable shoulder so you can push your pull. There's an old uh, coach I was working with a long time ago in the NFL. He said, I like the bench. It ties the arms to the body. And Hmm. here is a coach of the old generation who understood that kids who could bench press effectively could knew how to break the bar, bend the bar, spread the bar, and create a stable shoulder construct. When they grab something, they could create that rotation through the system because they trained, and that made them more effective blockers and tacklers and better able to find positions where they could generate more force, right? Mm. And... Um, you can't do a muscle up with your shoulders, not in an organized position. You can't, there's just some things you can't do. You, you can't hand balance with your hands totally cattywampus and turned out and unbalanced. You just, you can't do it. So what we're seeing is that there, if we train these movement principles, then, then the movement learning happens. That's called practice, right? Practice doesn't make perfect practice, makes permanent. And when we teach principles over and over and over again, they become our default positions for the person. But Mm. the real question is, and I think this is, I think where we get into the the weeds a little bit is how much formal gym training do I need? And then how much exposure should happen in play because, or in sports. And what we see is that people aren't doing sports, go play badminton and show me (laughs) how crazy your, you know, your body gets. Um, There's an old game that came out, 
became popularized in early CrossFit, but it's actually much older than that. It's called Hoover Ball. And Hoover Ball was invented by President Hoover. And all you do is take a light medicine ball, you know, something no heavier than like 12 pounds, 12, 14 pounds, and you play volleyball with it. You don't bump, set, and spike. You throw the ball over the net. And I just guarantee you, go ahead and play Hoover Ball, and I'll show you all the holes in your body, in your body's rotation, and your stability, and your catching left, and having to decelerate and throw. And, and That sounds super fun. It is super fun. And you can play it with two people, four people in a tiny badminton net. You really like we set up Hoover ball. We set up a strap across our, our racks in our gym and we play Hoover ball to warm up. Mm -hmm. And what we're really asking again is how much of this movement play do I try to replicate formally in the gym? Do I need to throw a medicine ball in every plane of motion and every organization? No, I, I'm going to teach the principles of throwing the medicine ball in the gym and have some rotation exposure and side bending, but it's impossible to replicate all the things. So really what ends up happening now is, well, do you skateboard? Do you run? Do you tumble? Do you, you know, and, and suddenly you're like, oh, GMB fitness makes a whole lot of sense, hmm. right? Working on flow, play, you know, having exposure, working at your limits. And suddenly you're like, oh yeah, that's yoga. I mean, it really is, but just, you know, in a different language. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I will go out and throw the frisbee as a warm up, and the amount of cutting and sidestepping and rotation and reaching, I can't replicate that in the gym. And I think that mm -hmm. is at the heart of what we're doing. So let's take our formal movement practices, which are excellent, and then decide what is essential and decide, well, I'm going to go mountain bike the rest and work on my balance and my vision and my head and you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. What I think is missing from this calculus now, and it is complicated, is this thing called play. Yeah. And we're not doing any playing. And so now we're saying, well, I don't eat food, so I better take all of these vitamins to go along with my protein powders. That's what's mm. happened in the gym. Where we've so for hyper formalized everything and fetishized the weight room to a place where, and go me wrong, let me just back up and say, I'm not trying to back away from my statement, but there are times in your life where the gym in your garage is all you have. You have newborns and you're traveling and you get 30 minutes of swinging kettlebells and, and, you know, getting on the bike. I mean, you're killing it. Just keep doing that. That's the input. But your goal is to go outside and move your body. And we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, that's all awesome. Um, I think that's really helpful information and that's inspired me to play more. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of that and living in Texas where that's, summer all the time somehow um that should be pretty easy to do so um i want to change up the conversation a little bit because i know that you could talk to this stuff all day but what people don't know might not know about you if they haven't met you is just how optimistic uh, of a guy you are and something that really stuck with me i think the first time you met me the first time we actually hung out um you know at that conference you, you looked at me and you said, Dean, believe people can be better or something along those lines. Do you remember that? Or do you remember saying something along those lines? If I did, I apologize. That sounds <laughs> it's like, like, I hope you slap me. Um, I, you know, I suspect that you and I were having that moment where we were discussing what felt like a constant uphill battle where we were spitting in the wind, um, that there was this avalanche where we we were seeing that people are more and more confused and that the changes in the environment that people are experiencing, the walking less, the, you know, the sleep less, the less movement. I think we're seeing that those things sometimes happen at a rate that's faster than we can help people accommodate to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Juliet and I have always believed simultaneously. I think we hold two beliefs. One is that we're doomed. But the other is that if you give people better information, well, I mean, let me, let me back that up for a second. Let's look at right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh -huh. How are we doing? Well, I just saw data that our kids are heavier, depression is through the roof, opiate use and alcoholism is up, mm. obesity has, has climbed back up. Um, we're seeing more orthopedic pain, more depression. I'm like, how's it going? Let's test our system, you know? <laughs> and I don't mean to throw a light at this, but what I say is, well, those things were true before the pandemic and they've mm -hmm. been, they've been worse. If Dune, if, I don't know if everyone knows, but, um, is the greatest book of all time. And, um, in the actual book, 
uh, you know, when Paul puts his hand in the box, he pulls it back out. And the, the Reverend Mother says, our test is crisis and observation. And Paul says, I see the truth of it. And that means that she in, introduced this crisis to him by in this, this induction where he puts his hand in the box, he thinks his hand's on fire, and she just observes him. And does he pull his hand out and react from it? Or does, how does he handle it? How does he deal with the pain? Like the whole thing, crisis and observation. And that's really where I think we're trying to create people and practices and families that allow us to deal with crisis. And that crisis could be global pandemic, or it could be, I wasn't able to sleep last night because I had a deadline or I have a newborn or I had to fly to this, you know, overnight on a red eye to get for this job, or I have, I work two jobs. I have a long commute. That's the crisis. And the observation is how do I handle that? How do I, what are the, what are the levers of my behavior? And so the flip side for Juliet and I is, we always feel like if we can help people understand in a simplified, organized way that you don't have to become, have abs and quit your job and become, you know, a, a private chef plus a strength and conditioning instructor, you can integrate these practices into your life. And if you have better information, you'll make better choices. And mm -hmm. we're, it's a, what I think has come to happen or come to be is that I have a new saying or saying, which helps me to think about this. The glacial pace is the breakneck pace. That changing behavior is really difficult. And mm -hmm. the work that the sort of the gang of men and women and people that we work with who are working towards the same destination, it can feel like we're not making progress. It feels like we're just being overwhelmed and sucked up the face of the wave. But we can't understand the true metrics of where we're going right now because it's just, it takes so long. Mm -hmm. If I might just drop another Dune quote in there, the slow blade penetrates the shield, right? Yeah, you've uh, something that you've emphasized a lot in everything that you put out is as before you show me, before you show me heroic, show me consistent. Whew. Right? It's way more fun to be, you know, do my 30 day V shred and, and, you know, or go on my keto shred fast or, you know, I'm going to blast mm -hmm. myself. And, you know, I think we, it's normal for humans not to think in long terms. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a survival mechanism. We think about today, we think about the week. Um, in economics, we tend to not, we tend to think that the people, our versions of ourselves in the future will be smarter and have better resources than the person we have today. So we're like, I'll start this in the future and I'll, my, my future self will be more, more mm -hmm. tolerant and better disciplined and, and that's a lie. So we, we, you know, we sort of discount uh, who we are going to be in the future. And, you know, I think what we also simultaneously want to be working on is the idea that um, we could borrow from the, the British world, the British cycling team we work with. And they had this idea called aggregation of marginal gains. Hmm. And that we're getting in James if, Clear here. That's right. If you sleep a little bit, eat, drink a little more water, you know, eat some more protein and vegetables, move your body a little bit, rinse, wash, repeat over time, that really makes huge changes. And I think, again, I think that it's reasonable for us to sort of think in the, in the short term. But if we did long term stuff, if we really looked at, you know, finite, infinite games, when do you win your health? We're all going to lose our health. We all die eventually. You know, mm -hmm. I think... Um, when did you win your fitness on the Instagram? I, I won fitness today. You know, I took my shirt off one day in October and I had abs and then I just went back to eating, you know what I mean? So <laughs> we really are looking at health and fitness as a something we can win. And that is, we can't win. Can you win? How do I win my marriage? How do I win my job? You know, and I think when we apply that game theory of, these are kind of closed systems where I have a success and then I retire. That is really along with the fact that it's difficult for us to project ourselves 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. You know, I can drink a bottle of bourbon tonight and just I'll be terrible tomorrow. But, you know, is, will that affect me in 30 years from now? No. But if I continue to drink, a, you know, two or three glasses of bourbon or a half a bottle of wine tonight to, to cope with my anxiety, 
in 30 years, I guarantee you that will have a consequence. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think what we're trying to help people do with heroicism is to say, hey, every day you have this 24 hours to play as well as you can. And then we'll, the, the game starts tomorrow. And if you just messed up, you're going to sleep a little bit more, walk a little bit more, hug a little bit more, you know, get some more sunshine on your body, move your body a little bit more. And uh, tomorrow you'll get to play better. And, and if you just keep doing that, I think it's really remarkable and shocking how much better you feel. And I think that's, at the end of this, what we want to continue to remind people is you should do the things we're talking about, not because you may get injured or have pain or, or you know, have a life you don't imagine for yourself. That's the wrong way to sell anything. You know, don't smoke because you'll get cancer. Well, I may or may not get cancer a long time from now. It's really difficult to sell. You don't realize how good you can feel and how much a better life you can have and how much more energy you can have at three or four o'clock or with your kids or, you know, we want you to have a really robust, incredible life. And I don't think you realize that you, you think you're, you're cruising at level 10, but I guarantee you're probably cruising at level four. And that, mm -hmm. and, and if you do the things that we're all sort of talking about, you can feel better. And then that means you have more energy and better relationships. And, you know, then when it's time to die, you're like, woof, I get a break. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, so I wanted to touch on this, the, the topic of you being a dad at least once. Um, and, uh, as a fellow dad, I have been, well, I've only been a dad for like a year and a half. Isn't it interesting how like the, the most intense part of being a dad starts immediately and then it only gets like, it gets easier. Like you're not a dad. Now you're a dad. And then like, it gets easier as they get older. I think that's, that's mean. Um, thank you biology. But anyways, you and Juliet have done an amazing job at being parents, but keeping up with all of these adventures. You know, you're going mountain biking, you're, you're traveling, you're, you're doing all these really fun things. Um, I'm, I became a dad during the pandemic. So I'm a dad. I have that less time. I'm also living in the pandemic where we're like not going into stores and I'm really scared of like this, this habit, like this habits that we've developed persisting of just not doing things. So can you help me and help guys who are in my help dads in my situation? What advice do you have to being to being parents and continuing to, you know, to just do adventures? Whew, well, I, I will say that it feels intense right now, but wait till you have teenagers. And then, uh, and that, you know, it, it becomes like, you know, the first order of business when we're beginning to exercise is, are you exercising and training? Yes or no. Do you eat fruits and vegetables and protein? Yes or no. And then once after you've been doing this for a decade or, you know, 16 or 17 years, suddenly you are arguing about which foot position allows you to have the most force. So then the conversations become nuanced and more complicated. It's different. It's different. Hmm. Um, once again, I think I, Juliet, and my, my wife and I, um, have really rad kids, but maybe not. We haven't run this experiment long enough to know how it's going. Truly, we, they may be terrible people, right? Today, they're great people, but I'll, I'll let you know when they're 30 or 40. So I, I love you sharing the kids of your sto the stories from your kids. And you're always, you're always so excited to share those stories. So I think, I think they must be pretty awesome. Well, I think they're awesome. And also, um, you know, it, having kids really put a filter on these practices for Juliet and I, because, you know, if you're a, a single person with a simple job and, you know, you can meal prep and sleep, you know, control these things, it's super easy, but just have a kid and let me know how that goes for you. Mm. Let me know how, you know, your wonderful sex life and all the deep sleep you're having and all the <laughs> dense training you're having and, and uh, you know, you're like, hey, kid, are you going to eat that mac and cheese? I'm eating that, you know? And, <laughs> and uh, you know, you're, you're stuffing a handful of puffs down your throat, you know, and smashing their, uh, their bone broth packet. You know, you'll, you'll see that it, um, it's difficult to play a perfect game. You can't. So you just have to play the best game you can. Um, you know, I think it's easy to look at the kids as, for Juliet and I, as, um, you know, the things that make us us is we like to play, we like to be outside. Um, and we just brought our kids along with that and try to mm -hmm. incorporate our kids. And some of it, I think, is a, a catastrophe. And some of that, you know, is um, 
planting seeds and what I call planting traps for my kids to, to step <laughs> on. They're the same thing. Um, last night, my 16 year old, she's a junior. I was like, she, I know she has water polo last night. I'm like, Hey, what are you doing? She's making dinner and she's cooking dinner for her and her sister. And she's zipping out to do some front squats before her water polo practice. And I literally am like, what, what do you want? I don't trust you. Like, what's happening <laughs> here? You know? And, um, you know, is there still conversations about, Hey, you need to eat more fruits and veggies and you can't smash mac and cheese after your water polo practice. And sure. But you know, the key is this is such a long game. And if you really want to see the value of heroicism versus consistency, watch how parents give up fighting the battles of food with their kids or exercise with their kids. You know, Julie and I have first some first principles that we, you know, are very strong about. Our kids have time limits on their tech, phones go away. Like we're like we protect their sleep and we're harsh about it, you know. And you know, imagine giving your kids some heroin and you're like, "Hey, I'm going to put the heroin, but just don't touch the heroin in your room. This cocaine is just next to your bed. <laughs> just leave it alone all night long." And like if I'd wake up and if I put cookies next to my bed, I wake up in the middle of the night and eat cookies. Right. I mean, that's how powerful that is. So we just have to look at some of these tech and some of these other things is we just remove it and make it a non thing. And we're so harsh about it. And that's because if we can protect our sleep, get our kids to, you know, be in a community of and play and rinse, wash, repeat, you know, and, and some of it is as simple as we really go out of our way to try to sit down and eat dinner. Even if it's for 10 minutes, we all sit at the table together and let me know how that goes for you over the course of a decade and a half. Because it'll take that long to see and understand what's going on. And I think a lot of parents get into their teenager years and they're so burned out and so fried and they're, the stress in their lives with their regular work, they're just coping. And they're like, oh, my kids can finally drive. And, you know, and they, they sort of like, I'm running a marathon. And then I get to mile 21 and I'm like, I pulled my hamstring. You go on without me, you know. And, and I just think it's just like any other practice you don't win being a parent. You just play better tomorrow. And Juliet and I are very simpatico about being on the same page and about managing this, you know, and, and we're, we're not perfect and we're not great, but I think we're so, we try to be really, really consistent mm. and uh, that makes it easier. Probably okay. also, you know, Juliet and I are parents, you know, children of divorce. And that's why we got into exercise and control <laughs> anyway. So we're just like, what if we just stayed married and made our kids dinner? Wouldn't that be easier? Wow. Yeah. I know. And it's not for everyone. I know. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you, that's your model, but uh, it's, that's worked for us. So, you know, I think bringing your kids along on the things you like to do mm -hmm. is a pretty good way not to have to lose those things. So if you're a surfer, you need to start making it so fun to get your kids surfing. If you love to ski, then, you know, your kids are on skis. And as soon as they're like, hey, I want a hot chocolate, you're like, let's do it, you know? And, uh, you know, you make it so fun and then you rinse, wash, repeat. And pretty soon they're like, no, no, I don't want to go yet. I want to ski more. And you're like, okay, my work here is done. Awesome. That sounds totally doable. So let me All ask, right. let me ask the boss. Did I miss anything, Jay? I'll be honest. I wasn't listening to anything. <laughs> she wasn't listening. Oh, that's funny. Um, all right. I know we don't have a ton of time, so I want to get into my kind of rapid fire questions for you. Oh boy. All right. All right. Uh, make this as rapid as you want. Um, what do you think is one Jeez. habit, <laughs> one habit, a belief or a mindset that has helped you the most in terms or helped you a lot in terms of your overall happiness? Um, in, you know, I probably, the number one thing is running everything that we do through this filter of, does this get my family more time together or less time together? No. Mm. Um, I've been with this incredible woman for 20 plus years now. We met in 2000. Um, and J star is my wingman and my number one. And I do make a lot of decisions like, Hey, I'm not going to pick up this new sport because Juliet's not into that new sport. Hmm. It's not that I don't have a life without Juliet, but I really go out of our, my way to make sure that that thing, that relationship, that organization, that play with my partner is sorted first because that will make my life way, way better. And from that, I would say, I also have come to appreciate that Juliet 
has a set of vision and understanding and perception of the world that are things that I do not perceive or understand and that she's actually on the same team I am. So when I come home and I'm like, no, this is the way. And Juliet's like, well, you may, you may not be considering the whole thing. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> so, you know, now I can really understand, I think that, um, you know, we're not in opposition, but Juliet is a teammate and man, she has a whole set of skills that I want to leverage and it makes my life better. I hope she heard that response. She's not listening. She doesn't care. Oh, okay. Fair. All right. Uh, what's one thing you do for your health that you think is overlooked or undervalued by other people? Um, sleep, 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 sleep. I live, dude, sleep, sleep, how much, sleep, how sleep. much sleep do you get? We try to sleep somewhere between eight and 10 hours. Nice. And, uh, do you take naps? Really, uh, I have something that Juliet calls the gift. And sometimes I'm like, I need to go take a nap and I can just shut my eyes on a floor and wake back up 10 minutes later and be back. Mm -hmm. um, Juliet is a terrible napper and she's very jealous of my napping skills, but we, we live busy lives. I don't think there's a lot of time for naps. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I have to because I'm a big human who puts out a lot of energy, but during the week, there's no nap time, but we're in bed in the nines every night. We go mm -hmm. to bed and like Juliet and I love TV too. We do. We love to, I love to read and, but we're in the bed in the nines and we usually get up somewhere in the, in the sixes. So we really just go out of our way to get as much sleep as we can. Okay. Do you have a set time for a regular, I mean, I feel like this is a dumb question. Do you have a set time for a regular stress relief activity? I feel like so much of what, you know, play and exercise is stress relief, but maybe something that's, that's specifically stress relief. Um, we, uh, because we became friends with Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese really ended up understanding the power of the sauna. And um, we really go out of our way to spend as much time in our sauna as we can. So we hang out in the sauna a ton. And even if it's 15 minutes, but that sauna has been a part of our stress relief. If we are stressed, we go sit in the sauna and there's, it's dim, there's no tech, there's no lights. And the sauna breaks you no matter what. At some point, everyone gets too hot. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, and then that will help you to deal with the stress. So that is something that I like. If you could ever afford a sauna or work that out, or you have a friend in the neighborhood of the sauna, become friends with them mm -hmm. because the sauna is, uh, is we feel like is one of the keys to our success. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm trying to figure out where I can fit a sauna in my, in my three bedroom bungalow. I might have to like stuff it in a corner of my bedroom the right now. I have a, a yeah. sauna. I have an infrared sauna blanket which is kind yeah, of cool. It's like a body I think it, bag. Getting hot is cool. Um, you know, I think if you had a small place, infrared sauna could be great. It can take a lot of time to get hot. We think we like, we, we don't need to debate saunas here. Nordic sauna um, makes a little cabinet that, with an actual wet, dry sauna, like rocks that plugs into a wall. So with the same cabinet space, if you had a garage or a storage space or a deck, you could put a little mini sauna in. And again, I understand everyone's resources are different, but getting hot is one of those things. I think that is a principle that a lot of people figured out that really does help. Mm. Yeah. So take a hot bath, take the hot, like start sweating in your shower if that's what you got, you know? Mm -hmm. Or if you live in Texas, go outside. Just go outside, yeah. Literally go just outside. go outside in the summer if you're in Texas. Um, what's the most stressful part of your day-to-day -day life? Uh... You know, Juliet and I um, run a business, uh, the kids stuff, taking care of our parents. I think just there's not a single s stressful aspect, but it all aggregates. It's sort of background, you know, hustle, you know, mm -hmm. like it's Friday and Juliet and I are pretty burned. It's been a crazy week and we still have a lot to do. You know, we're we got presentations on Saturday and then we'll drop right back into our kids' lives. And so I think... There's this notion that you're either like in flow and you're like, you know, resting or you're working hard and the pendulum, it's not like the pendulum swinging both directions. And that's why you have to figure out how to manage this during the day. It can't be like, well, I'll get to the weekend and then I'll recover. That's just mm. not going to work. You, you have to do something else during the week. Yeah. Because it's so always able to, Yeah. So being able to manage stress in the moment, not having to... Not having yeah. to wait until uh, all right, and Juliet and I, as we wrap up, I'll just say that uh, you know Juliet and I have a really high work pain tolerance. You know, like so many other people, I think too. Of course, 
but uh, we we can just grind ourselves down to little pencil nubs if we're not careful. Yeah, I get I get that. All right, I got one more question for you. This is the big one. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing men and their well being right now? Who, uh, if I'm being totally transparent and frank, um, I don't think men do a very good job of creating a man community of friends. And those, mm. those could be women, that could be men, it could be persons. I don't think that they have a, they create their own little tribal council where they can be vulnerable. I think men are islands unto themselves. And then sometimes they go out with other men and they watch football and bro around. Mm -hmm. They don't create an opportunity to say, I'm losing my mind, help. Or what do you guys think about this? Or man, my marriage isn't going great. Or man, I really need help with my kids. What do you guys think? I think you need to cultivate and you have to go out and cultivate some friends and then be able to, you know, because I think as a man, you can, uh, you know, you need some, some, some people in the council who could call you out. And so you need to cultivate that. Yeah. I feel that, man, that's a, that's, that's hitting in a lot of hitting, hitting a lot of heads right now. Um, yeah. I'm glad you said and, and, that. And it's, it's a verb. You have to, you have to cultivate that so that you can be transparent and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Particularly being able to have that community where you can be vulnerable and really get into the stuff that's, you know, that's bugging you. Not just exercising. Not just, not just getting together and working it out or networking right. and talking that's about right. how to improve business because that's easy enough to find. It is. Um, all right, man. Kelly, that was so awesome. Thank you for joining me. Um, Kelly, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to, how to outro you just because there's so many things I could say. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with you, to, to get inspired by you? Uh, if you want to see how I think and how our brains work, you can follow us at The Ready State. Um, and then, you know, if you go to the race day.com, we have tried to curate an ecosystem to help me, you, help you do what you want to do better. And, uh, but you know, whether it's our newsletter or any of those things, but start, just start following us and see what you think. Yeah. They have amazing content. Highly recommend the ready state guys. Um, sweet. All right. Uh, Kelly, thanks again for joining me. I hope we get to talk again soon. Um, hopefully, uh, when the world changes, we can actually get together and hang out again. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, but until then, uh, I'll talk to you when I can. I can't wait to hold your kid, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's fun. That's how I got these biceps. You asked me last time. Just holding toddlers, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that people, people volume no training. Idea. No idea. Yeah. It's totally true. All right. Thank you, my uh, friend. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, see you in the next video or the next show. If you like that episode, check out this other one right here. I think you're really going to enjoy it. If you haven't subscribed, click this subscribe button over here, and you can listen to the full episodes on any major podcasting platform. Full details below in the description.